This program is brought to you by Emory University. Hello and welcome to you, both those here in the audience today, which is Tuesday, April 17th, 2012. And here at Lenbrook, a retirement community on Peachtree Road in Atlanta. And welcome also to all of those of you who are watching today. Uh, the, the video recorded version that we're making. This is another session of the Living History Project of the Emory University Emeritus College, a program that seeks to capture a composite oral history of Emory University from the testimony of its most distinguished faculty, its emeritus faculty. My name is John Buga. I am the director of the Emeritus College. And today we're extremely grateful to have with us Dr. Lewis J. Skip Elsas, and he's agreed to participate by sharing uh, memories of his long career at Emory, which lasted over 30 years, as Professor Emeritus of Pediatrics and Genetics in the School of Medicine. Dr. Elsas is a fourth generation Atlantan, born in Emory Hospital, hospital, and it's with his family history here in Atlanta that I would like to begin. Recently, our program coordinator, Isha Edwards, uh, was looking at condominiums in Cabbage Town, just east of downtown Atlanta. Uh, and specifically, she was looking at a development called the Stacks at Fulton Cotton Mill. And she learned from a brochure there that the main structure was built uh, in 1881 by a European immigrant by the name of Jacob Elsas. And putting two and two together, that name with the name of one of our most distinguished emeriti at Emory. She uh, suggested that we talk to Dr. Elsis and get him to fill in some of that history. So it's with that history, if you don't mind, I would like to begin. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask you about your great-grandfather. About my great-grandfather, Jacob. Thank you, John. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this our pleasure. living history. Um, I can start with great-grandfather Jacob Elsis, who was born in uh, Ludwigsburg, Germany, uh, in 1842. Yeah. And he was an orphan uh, and came to this country uh, to escape the Franco-Prussian Wars, but mm -hmm. ironically was immediately uh, drafted into the Civil War. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, wound up in uh, Cartersville, Georgia, after the war, and started a retail business. Built the first uh, building in, of brick in Cartersville, and is part of the Bartow County history. Uh, Museum as well. Mm -hmm. But he and uh, his friend Mr. May came to Atlanta uh, in 1868. They started first in the retail business, the Elsus May business, and then because his family had been weavers in Europe, he saw all this cotton going north and figured out that technology and industry might move south mm -hmm. and started the Fulton Bag and Cotton Mills, uh, the stacks as they're now called, uh, were completed in 1881. And he became really the largest industry, uh, weaving cotton into cloth uh, and canvas. These were used for bags at that time to, as containers. The, uh, the mill, by the time he died in, 18, uh, in 1932, at age 90 years, mm. had five other uh, locations. And he employed some 2,600 folks. Uh, were they in Georgia? All over the nation, actually. Oh, really? They were in, uh, Five other states: St. Uh -huh. Louis, Dallas, My uh, goodness. Uh, New Orleans, Brooklyn, and he placed all of his uh, six sons in, as managers of this place. So there was a, uh, a little bit of nepotism, which, in fact, uh, I think <laughs> probably hurt uh, the business uh, over time. Anyway, as far as Atlanta is concerned, and, and myself, uh, Jacob was a, a great um, contributor to the Atlanta community. He started, for example, Grady Hospital. They really? started the foundations that, that produced that. Of course, Emory has used that as its major uh, medical teaching hospital. He started um, Georgia Tech. And he brought his first son, Oscar, out of MIT and made him a member of the first graduating class of Georgia Tech in really? 1886. Um, the mill closed in about 1970, just ran out of steam, and was bought by Allied Products. And then at the end of the uh, 1970s, it really closed. And there was a poor community now, Cabbage Town or the Mill Village, that, that remained. 
it, the, the mill itself had been proclaimed a historical site because it represented the architecture of early Atlanta industry. And the Adderhold family, who happened, the mother of that, happens to be here at uh, Lindbrook, bought and uh, reconstructed this building in, in its uh, historical uh, architectural state. And the lofts now are apartments and condominiums uh, that are available. And you had something to do with the renovation. I, I didn't have anything to do with the renovation. This is completely the Adderhold properties that oh. did that. But I was working in the Cabbage Town area with Esther Lefevre in the uh, 80s to try to help the community. We started something called the Patch and uh, tried to help the community yeah. uh, provide um, some of their crafts for, uh, the, for the right. community. And by that time, I was at Emory. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. I, I was starting our genetics program there and uh, also concerned about the community. But that gives you some background. It's right. uh, my interest in Atlanta and the uh, mission to try to help. Could you talk a little bit about growing up in this city, which at that time was much smaller than it is? Now it's five point some million. And right. We I had, know it was, everybody knew everybody else in really? Atlanta at that point. There were about 200,000, <laughs> period. Wow. Uh, I was privileged to grow up in uh, northwest Atlanta in the woodlands, basically. Uh -huh. Went to Eva Edwards Lovett's original school, which is a little wooden um, uh, schoolhouse on West Wesley Road that housed small classes from kindergarten all the way through seventh grade. A little bit bigger now. It's a little <laughs> bigger now, and then it's moved. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But Mrs. Lovett was quite a school mom. Uh, we, we paid attention to her. As, as students. But then you went away to uh, yes, prep we, school. Yes, yeah. we had a family tradition of being uh, educated in New England. And uh -huh. I was sent off at a uh, very early age, 13, to Phillips Academy in Andover, Mass., uh -huh. which turned out to be a very important uh, era for me because you learned to be independent. On yes, the, indeed. And they had uh, excellent uh, teachers in biology, which got me very interested in, in uh -huh. the formal aspects of uh, biological sciences at an early age. And then the summers when I would come home, I uh, actually got a job at Emory, which reinforced my interest in biochemistry and biology. I worked with uh, Professor Will Helming in the Department of Biochemistry. He was the chair. He let me wash dishes. <laughs> that was very important because uh, we had glassware. No, no disposable plastics, and the glassware had to be washed very carefully. Every day, yeah. So then you went to Harvard, a well-known university in the Northeast. I did, and that was also, I majored in biochemistry and did you? continued to reinforce an interest both in research and in this uh, discipline of, uh, of biochemistry. Uh, and do you think at that time that Harvard was doing uh, cutting-edge work? In oh, absolutely it was. It was then and is now? Yes, it was yeah. then, and you can imagine the effect of a Nobel laureate teaching you uh, a small a course in a small group session uh, in biochemistry. Yeah. It was uh, amazing. And your decision to go to medical school, you said you made in Vietnam or after going to Vietnam, but this was not in, was this in the military? Or? Well, yes, that was a little bit uh, uh, true and untrue. It was not in the military. I was, well, after college, I, we had already applied to medical school and was accepted, but I wasn't really sure I wanted to do all that kind of work. Uh. I went to Vietnam to work in Saigon with the Philippine ambassador. And uh, mm. I guess I made my decision to work in the human system as a to contribute because I thought I could contribute more by seeing Tom Thomas Dooley take penicillin to kids with yaws in uh, Laos. Uh -huh. And they were treated and cured within the summer period that I was there. And that looked uh, like a better way to contribute quickly. So you're interested in children's problems very early. Huh? Yes, that's true. Yeah. Very true uh, from that experience. How about the so, University of Virginia and, and the kind of medical training you got there? Got superb training. These were the days of small classes. Mm. And uh, professors such as uh, Bill Parson allowed me to do research as part of the curriculum. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, with uh, groups of two or three, we were given responsibility for the care of patients. I guess the most important thing that happened to me at the University of Virginia was I met my wife, who is you now 50 that. years uh, with me, and uh, we had our children when we moved on to New Haven. Mm -hmm. 
where I took my postdoctoral work at the residency, again with an Emory professor, Paul Beeson, who had been here at Grady. He uh -huh. was the chair of the Department, uh, at, uh, the Department of Medicine at uh, Yale University. Could you say some more about, uh, the, you had a residency at Yale and then you were a faculty member? Yes, we were in New Haven for eight years. Uh -huh. And uh, three years were in the formal residency program. And then I had uh, five years uh, of doing research. Uh, Lee Rosenberg was a mentor of mine. And it's there we I began to realize that genetics could be a, a true discipline in medicine a specialty along mm. the same lines as pediatrics or yeah. medicine or surgery or psychiatry. And in fact, that has happened over the years. But the, the foundations were laid when I came back to Emory uh, and began to sort of preach in this area of uh, an important discipline. Could you talk more about the status of medical genetics when you were at Yale? I mean, how, how far advanced was it? And well, well, it wasn't advanced at all. It, it was a, basically it was a, not advanced. Yeah, Lee was one of the major uh, foundation pioneers of this area. And uh, it was with him that I both got interested in a specific research project, which was how molecules uh, were transported across uh, the plasma membrane into cells. Mm -hmm. And I focused <clears throat> on carbohydrates and monosaccharides. Um, but genetics, per se, was uh, still in its em embryonic stage, if you will. Mm -hmm. You looked at a few rare uh, dysmorphic problems in childhood age group, and we were doing some biochemistry, which is what, of course, interested me from my background. Mm -hmm. um, but there really wasn't a, a formal discipline at, at that point. And you have said, and to me earlier, that the, the genetics involves research, of course, but also a lot of a lot of service and a lot of teaching. Yeah, Can you so talk are, about the yeah the, the teaching and the service. I'd like to hear more about. It. Yeah, those were the days where if you were going to succeed in academic medicine, you had to be able to do all three areas well and in a competitive areas. Uh, you had to provide service in the form of direct patient care. Mm -hmm. You had to be able to teach your discipline to at least medical students and. Uh, had to be able to compete for research grants from the National Institutes of Health or other uh, foundations that might uh, be interested in your work. So we, we were the triple threat, as they called it. <laughs> you might also call those dinosaurs today <laughs> because uh, no one can really do all three of those at, at the level required to be successful. Is, is that something you lament, though? I mean, has it become much too complicated to try to do all three, or can only supermen do that? Uh, well, individuals cannot do that anymore. but. Um, no. Organizations can do it. So the schools uh, are now recognizing the fact that to be a great educationalist, you have to focus on being able to teach and bring innovative methods for teaching. In the research area, you have to be able to compete in your area of uh, focused science and bring in um, Im important ideas and solve some of them and get grants from the national for, to do the work. And uh, to provide service, you have full time to be a, a doctor for patients yeah. with uh, problems. So you came back to Emory from Yale, and when when was that? In 1970. 70. Uh, my wife and three kids uh, came back to my hometown, and it was uh, I'm back again uh, here 30, <laughs> 40 right. years later. What was it that mo motivated you to come back besides uh, maybe nostalgia for the place where you grew up? And well, it wasn't just nostalgia. It was a, a sort of a family history of wanting to uh, contribute to my my hometown. Mm -hmm. And when we talked about great grandfather. I think that non-city, uh, not for self, uh, motive was what brought me back. And I wanted to bring genetics and have an opportunity to develop it. So we had a couple of years of discussion with uh, President Laney and with uh, Chairman Willis Hurst and with Dick Bloomberg, who mm -hmm. were instrumental in helping me, and with Alfred Wilhelmy, who was still the chairman of yes. biochemistry. So it looked like the field had been plowed properly and it was ready for some seeds. Could I ask you, did Emory recruit you? Did they, did they make a special effort to bring you here? Or? They did, because the big question was, what is medical genetics? And there mm -hmm. was no immediate answer because it really hadn't been defined yet. Yeah. So. And this is how I became a pediatrician. If you're going to use the power of genetics, um, 
you need to be able to predict, intervene, and prevent heritable components of a disease process. Mm -hmm. So where would be the best age group to work in but the childhood age group? Many people go into, I've taught undergraduates who want to be doctors, and they also of, often express a wish of, to go into pediatrics because they like kids. Absolutely. But that, was that part of your... No, absolutely part <laughs> of what, why I did it, yes. Good. And yeah. I still love the, uh, the childhood age group. and. Children have very rapid changes in their physiology, and uh, they're very appreciative if you help them get better. So Emory was very receptive to the idea of your coming in and establishing a new specialty. Yes, that was and very. Did, did, did it give you the kind of help that you expected and wanted? And yes, absolutely. And generous enough? Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the um, uh, Dick Bloomberg, who's the chair of pediatrics, had a beautiful laboratory that uh, they had built in the Woodruff Research Building, mm -hmm. and uh, there was certainly enough to do at Grady Hospital and Eggleston Hospital and the Emory University Hospital, so those were all uh -huh. clinical areas for the service component uh, and the research component, and so we, that I, could, I had uh, won a career development award from NIH and a, a good-sized uh, R01 to do my research. So we were paying our own way. Was there a time limit on that, or was it? Was oh yeah, uh, that was a. <laughs> it was a, well. It turned out to be a, a, a ten-year period, mm -hmm. which was enough, 1970, 1980, to get things started. Get things in my rolling. Own way. Yeah. yeah, indeed. Now you talked about the teaching a di different kinds of students during your career as a teacher, um, postdocs, and yes. Any undergraduates? Or were you yes, I had appointments in pediatrics, medicine, and biochemistry. Biochem. Well, biochemistry enabled uh, me to teach uh, uh, graduate students, and uh, our labs had mm -hmm. uh, PhD level research projects. So we also taught medical students, and uh, Don McCormick was the uh, chairman of pediatrics, I know Don uh, excuse well. me, of, of biochemistry. Bio biochem excuse me. And he was very receptive to the idea that uh, after, that the second semester of biochemistry should morph into genetics. Uh -huh. So he would teach in the first semester purines and pyrimidines as structural uh, chemicals, and we would take over with uh, uh, the functional aspects of molecular genetics, uh, transcription, uh -huh. translation, post-translational processing, functional proteins, how the chromosome condense the DNA, and we would give clinical correlates with that. Mm -hmm. Actually, I enjoyed putting that course together for several reasons. Uh, one was uh, that I could use a format of four hours a week, but only three hours were lectures. One, and then there was one hour of reading original articles. Really? And the mm -hmm. graduate students in small groups. And so the graduate students and the medical students in groups of no more than six Faculty intensive. I had 20 faculty who were willing Whoa, to do this. Really, read an original article that had uh, uh, was research, but had some correlate with what we had just studied that week. Mm -hmm. So we had uh, breakfasts among the faculty, where we would discuss the article ourselves as a faculty, yeah. and have some sort of uh, uh, communication that made it more appropriate uh, for everyone to. It's, it sounds as if you should have won a teaching award for this, did you? No. Not, you didn't. should have, because that uh, sounds very creative. Well, it was, it was creative, but it, it was an interesting situation. Uh, medical students really didn't like the course. <laughs> Why was that? Well, for one thing, they thought reading an original article was a waste of time. <laughs> I, was, I oh, thought that we were going to be able to get them interested in that they'd have a lifetime uh, skill uh, to uh, read an original article. Well, but at the time in the curriculum uh, of medical students, you're taking so many different disciplines that right. the organization of time was more important than um, than no. learning how to read an original article. I don't, uh, suppose, I don't suppose it has gotten any easier for no, medical I, students. I well, probably not. That may not be true because now with uh, electronic communication, hmm. the internet, they can get you can gather so much information so fast oh, that uh, you don't have to thumb through libraries of big textbooks anymore. You suggested uh, one of the groups you also taught was uh, genetic counselors in the school of nursing. <clears throat> yes, well, that was an interesting population. Well, I, I had a. Uh, it is an interesting population, and nursing was one of my uh, um, uh, interests in terms of disciplines because mm -hmm. families are involved in the nursing curriculum. 
So all nurses uh, have to deal with the family as a whole when they when they're someone's sick. And they were very uh, receptive to the idea of pedigrees and, and talking to families about genetic risk. So I felt, and they were also part of the healthcare team uh, as compared to something separate. Mm -hmm. So yes, we, uh, we offered uh, uh, genetics uh, master's degree levels for nurses in their perinatal medicine uh, program, which they were very receptive. And in fact, some of the counselors that we trained are still here. Uh, Carlene Coleman is still the primary counselor at Eggleston Hospital in genetics. Uh, that was a, a very successful uh, project, and Emory was the leader in that. Um, there is an international society of uh, genetic nurses now. I saw really? them, they call it. And, oh. uh, it's a very small group, but it's a very effective group. And are they, they trained to look for symptoms of the sort of yes, <coughs> uh, genetic they, maladies that you're Yes, they, uh, uh, as part of the healthcare team, yeah. they saw the patients with us, saw how we intervened, understood the laboratory basis of genetics, which, by the way, we haven't really discussed. No, well, let's talk uh, about that. What is medical genetics? Yeah, what is medical so, genetics, actually? Over this 30-year period, it, uh, it became defined, mm -hmm. uh, the overall mission being to predict, intervene, and prevent heritable disease from being irreversible. Um, and You're the, using the passive voice. It, I think you had a lot to do with doing well, it. I did. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should but, get that on the table. Yeah, okay, thank you. <laughs> the, uh, so we defined three different laboratory-based uh, arenas in which to make these diagnoses. One of them is uh, cytogenetics, which originally was looking at chromosome structure mm -hmm. and number, and now it has morphed into looking at the DNA uh, pieces at a very small level, at a million, more than a million pieces uh, over the entire chromosome for whether they're there or not there and how they're arranged. Then there's a second one was molecular genetics, which involves oh. total human genome sequencing yeah. or exome sequencing now, or specific mutations that cause a disease. For example, breast cancer caused by one gene, the RCA1 or two, mm. uh, would be part of that diagnostic, or cystic fibrosis, or where, where the DNA changed has to do with what you would expect in terms of the outcome and your intervention. And then biochemical genetics, which is where mm -hmm. my specific interest is, where you look at the analytes of a, of a process. Um, and then, so those are three laboratory disciplines. And then there's clinical genetics, which is applying this laboratory and doing what an MD does, physical exams, yeah. and using general uh, healthcare methods and it involves all disciplines, uh, not just pediatrics, but also medicine and surgery and uh, psychiatry, for example, OBGYN. And we had uh, postgraduate postdocs that trained up in all of those areas to be now board certified as geneticists by the American Board of Medical Genetics. Now genetics, medical genetics, is recognized as a specialty of the AMA. Yeah. So I look back on this, and uh, <laughs> it's been a uh, very rapid, actually, when you think of it in terms of 30-year period um, e evolution into a specialty of healthcare. Could you talk a little bit about some of the metabolic disorders, like like this one that has a wonderful name, maple syrup urine disease? <laughs> okay, and that's yeah. Um, you know, let's see how that starts. Okay, so biochemistry interest to begin with from childhood, from memories uh, working with Dr. Wilhelmy. The human, uh, then I, it, that sort of evolved into looking for, at metabolic diseases in general, mm -hmm. and then into what, what disorders do we know about that we can screen for and intervene to prevent a, yeah. a bad outcome. Well, maple syrup urine disease is one of the ones that I was involved in very early. Um, it got its name because of a block in a metabolic sequence that resulted in the accumulation of organic compounds that smell very sweet in the urine, like yeah. maple syrup. Oh. Had a hard time convincing that name for Europeans because <laughs> maple sugar doesn't exist. Yeah, I knew that over there. Yeah. But it became an interesting problem to solve, not just because it was caused by a single gene, but because we could, first of all, understand the uh, abnormality in the protein and then work out therapeutic interventions to uh, overcome this block one of which was the use of uh, vitamin B1, thiamine, in, ex in pharmacologic as compared to mm. physiologic doses, 
which held this multi-enzyme complex together better and enabled it to function better. Okay. So that, mo that allowed us to uh, both diagnose from the analytes that were accumulated and to provide a therapeutic intervention by restricting branch chain amino acids and by providing uh, this uh, cofactor that helped the uh, block in the metabolic sequence. And you were testing kids at a very early age? Or? Yes, this became one of uh, now 44 different metabolic disorders that mm -hmm. we screen all newborns for using dry blood on filter paper. This is so, if you had a child or the child has been born in any state now since about 1975, they would have been screened for this disorder and uh, uh, treated before they got sick. And this is the source of the, in here in Georgia, the Georgia Newborn Screening Program. Yes, we were one of the first states to uh, right? develop a, yeah. a complete program in which public health did the screening. So you, this dried blood on filter paper was mailed by the hospital <clears throat> from the newborn mm -hmm. to a public health laboratory, and then Emory became the rapid retriever of the screen positive newborn and the resource for treating this child right away. So nurses and nutritionists and physicians mm -hmm. were, um, and the biochemistry lab yeah. were part of the genetics program then that were able to provide this child with, the screen positive child with the proper intervention. So we have thousands, literally, of children that have been prevented from having one of these very serious disorders um, from being irreversibly damaged. Now, is, has this gone um, international, I assume? You know? it, yes, it's gone national and, and yeah. international. Uh, I might digress a minute. We talked about public health. Uh, this was a public health problem. Yeah. And um, most effective if you have mass screening. So everyone is screened for because these are rare diseases. So right. you, the physician would not likely be able to pick it up uh, having never seen such a disorder. And we wanted to screen and det detect the affected infant before they were damaged. So you didn't want them to be sick by the time they were yeah. looked at. So public health problem. And what we did was to form through HRSA, which is one of the federal agencies, the Health Resource Services Administration. It's up there in the federal HHS pedigree along with NIH and, NI mm -hmm. and CDC and HRSA. Okay. HRSA uh, funded us in the southeastern region to develop first a, a regional program where the public health officials and the university-based geneticists would get together and discuss how best to, what, what was appropriate and how best to implement them. Um, we call ourselves SURGE, Southeastern Regional Genetics Group, and uh, that was composed of um, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana seceded from Texas and joined the SURGE group. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Tennessee and the Carolinas. Uh -huh. And then we went uh, and had the leaders of each of these regions uh, into the Council of Regional Networks, and that became a national program. So between the public health programs that, uh, that, they, that I just discussed and the Society for Inherited Metabolic Disorders, which I don't think we did discuss, but no. we, we, um, I was able to, I was a, actually the first president, founding president of this organization, where people who all over the nation who are working with these metabolic disorders could gather together to exchange research observations and their service observations. Um, that became an international project mm -hmm. in Europe, uh, Asia, England. So they all now have their own uh, societies for inborn errors for inherited metabolic disorders. And we gather every four years as an international group um, to do the same thing. And they're different, uh, interestingly enough, in, in Asia, for example, since these are heritable disorders, there are different frequencies of these diseases. And uh, anyway, there's a, mm -hmm. it is international. It's very interesting. It's very important, in my opinion, in, as a, uh, a way to predict and prevent disease. So this is Emory's gift to the world uh, and yours as well. well. Thank you. Uh, a very important one. <clears throat> Could you talk a little bit about leaving Emory and going to the University of Miami? Um, after about 30 years here. That was a tough decision. Um, I was 65. We built a, a nice division. Uh -huh. um, we needed a department because the way the administration is established, uh, a discipline is recognized if it's a department in the medical school. 
um, the department should have more of a genomicist than I was. And Steve oh. and Steve Warren, I actually acted as the interim chair of this department. And then we, and then Steve was um, uh, accepted the nomination to be the chair. And I wasn't ready to retire. And uh, Dr. Shalala, at, who had become the president of University of Miami, and I'd been going down there as a consultant on several occasions. I see. And she liked Emory's <laughs> template and wanted a similar program established. So, you know, I've been to Yale, done it, then to Emory, and done it. I figured I had another, I had a, still got a little gas going, Indeed. so we'll go down there and try it. So it took about eight years to do it. It took about 30 years to do it here at Emory. <laughs> and well, we got that. What was the support like there? Or was it. Uh... Well, munificent, I hope. It was munificent. Well, I wouldn't have gone if they hadn't had the support. <laughs> because uh -huh. I, could. Right. I mean, by that time, I it was a little bit too old to uh, to, to do it all by myself. But uh, they did provide the resources, and uh, we, we we have established a department there very similar to the one at Emory. Mm. Did you like Miami, living in Miami, or was it culture shock for you? It's a very right. different place than it's, Atlanta. It was actually. An extraordinarily nice experience. Um, yeah. The that town is very different from Atlanta. It's, it's an international town. Uh, the uh, Cuban refugees from at least th two to three generations live there now and have brought a, an international flair to yeah. the town. So, yeah. in center of town, we have good opera and symphony and art and culture. Uh, a lot of Spanish spoken. I bet. And uh, did you have to speak Spanish? Or? Actually, I did not. I was. Uh, not multilingual. Uh, Spanish wasn't one of my languages, but uh, everyone spoke English, or most mm -hmm. of them spoke English. Yeah. I learned how to say non hablo espanol. <laughs> so, after your time in at the University at my at University of Miami, um, you returned here and. Uh, coming back to Atlanta and Emory, I think that you must have had time to 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 reflect on. The, um, on your career at Emory. Um, so I'm wondering, as a, as a kind of last thing you might want to say, a parting shot, if you would be willing to talk about Emory as an institution of higher learning, specifically for medicine, and if you have any, any thoughts about what Emory should be doing in the next millennium, wow. the next hundred years or so. Well, reflecting on the past and the rapidity with which Emory has grown, you have to yeah to give credit to extraordinary people such as uh, President Jim Laney, Mr. George Woodruff, for the funding and the vision to build a, an, an exciting and important educational uh, program. Genetics was just one subunit of that whole. And I think Emory has been extremely successful. It's certainly uh, in the top 20 schools in the nation now. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a relatively young medical school, so right. having done that in a brief period of time is a, is a great credit to the to the medical school and the university as a whole. Are, are there any things that you may have learned from your experience at Miami that you would like people at Emory to know about that they perhaps should be thinking about? Well, they're very positive things, actually. Um, I don't want to be derogatory about the no. University of Miami, but it's a very young school. And yeah. a lot of what's had develops in, in schools uh, uh, depends on age and experience and funding, of course. So I think one of the things that Emory has that the University of Miami does not have is the Emeritus College, which I am fortunate enough to be able to benefit right. from right now. We're the beneficiary. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and as I recall, the, the provost was very happy with the idea of having an Emeritus College. And, a resource of faculty who don't cost him anything. <laughs> right. Well, I want to thank you. Um, on behalf of the Emeritus College, thank you for talking with us today and sharing your history. But I also want to thank you for making this history that you've made. It's uh, benefited all of us and all of our children. Um, you're one of Emory's most illustrious emeriti, and we are grateful now that your record is, uh, is has been left with us today. Thank you, John. It's, it's been a you. pleasure. Thanks so much.
The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.